Hello everyone. Welcome to another beer review. I'm a happy person today. Although we're back on the kegs, this isn't the keg that I was planning to review um, in this review. This beer was supposed to be reviewed a few weeks from now. But the reason I'm doing this is because I was supposed to be doing a beer from Butcombe in, uh, in kind of the Mendip, kind of uh, Bristol area. And uh, I ordered beer from the Butcombe Brewery in Bristol. Um, at the same time, I ordered this from this brewery. And this arrived with another beer, another keg, um, within two days, basically. And uh, the Buckham one, well, it arrived this week, basically almost two weeks. Um, and there was a lot, well, I'll, I'll tell you more when I actually do the review, because uh, let's be totally honest, sometimes it doesn't matter how good your beer is, a lot of it's to do with your kind of customer service and uh, your business practices. And let's just say the Buckham business practices were a bit kind of dubious, let's just say that. Um, I'm not going to say that they were conning me, but I do believe they were to a certain extent. And uh, that's just not on. So it's been delivered. I don't know to who, because I'm actually up in Scotland. Um, and it's been delivered, funnily enough, down in uh, in Derry. So I don't know who's got it. I know it's been delivered to one of my neighbours, but I don't know who, because the name is actually on it by DHL, I don't recognise, so God knows. <laughs> Oh, or maybe that was the name of the driver driver and he's fucked off home with it. I don't know. But anyway, hopefully it's still down there. But I'm up here, so it wasn't delivering time for me travelling up. So it's, uh, it's in the hand of the gods where the hell it is. And hopefully I can find it. And I will do it at some point. But today we're doing, oh God, we're doing Adnan's Old Ale. And the reason why I'm looking forward to this is because this is a mild. You don't get many milds nowadays. So it's nice. And this is basically based on a recipe from 1890. When I say based on it, it's because I've had to adjust it for the... how ingredients are nowadays. I mean, the grain and the malt and everything else is far different. The yield is far different from grains nowadays. And it was way back when the original recipe was round about 1890. So round about 1890, the yield from the grain, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on with my voice, <clears throat> but the yield you get from the grain nowadays is a lot more. And this is probably another reason why this is a lot higher than what it really should be. So you would class this as a kind of more of a strong mild, because I think it's, is it 4.1% if I remember rightly? Yes, 4.1%. Um, which again is higher than really what uh, a mill should be. A mill should really be between three and three and a half, kind of kicking about, hence why it's called a mill. But it should be a darker beer anyway. And again, it should have kind of nuttier tones and things like that. And there should be a nice bit of malt to it. So this is what we're kind of looking for. And because this is a fresh beer, um, I'm looking forward to it because... I'll be totally honest, I'm actually enjoying the beer from the kegs because it's it's a level up in quality. I'll be totally honest, right now, even the beers that I didn't think were that great in the bottle, I'm actually enjoying them far better. And some of them are actually different. The actual, the same beers, but they're actually done differently. They're actually done like the cask because that's really what they are. It's, it's the stuff that goes into the cask is also put into these. So that's why they've got a short shelf life. And I will be doing more of them because it is the kind of the original fresh beers. And well, a lot of these beers weren't brewed to go into bottles. These were brewed to be fresh beers, to go into casks and to be enjoyed in pubs. So this is the closest you can get without having to go and find them in the pubs. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. So I'll pause it now and uh, I'll check this in the machine and uh, see where we are. Okay, so we're back again. Um, so shall we get this beer poured? 
Right, let's see what this is like. Oh, it's a bit, it's a bit lively today. Very lively. So it is. It's always the same. Sometimes you, you have a test glass, and everything goes fine, and you never an issue or a problem. And then other times, You get that? Right, so while we wait for that to kind of calm down and we'll top it up in a minute. What I do have is a bit of a strange article um, that was basically published on the 16th of October. And it basically went along the lines of almost half of those polled by Kingfisher Drinks, some 46.9% identified carling as a UK's most boring beer. There you go. Boring is maybe the terminology I would use, but at the end of the day, it's up there as another kind of chart that I've got in my head, and it's uh, world's worst piss waters. <laughs> but the pattern leads the cases of punters voted in the most boring UK beers, and it basically has a top 10 of coming in at one is Carling, number two is Foster's, Number three is Stella Artois, good old wife beater. Number four is Heineken. Number five is San Miguel. Number six is Coors. Number seven is Carlsberg. Number eight is Amstel. Number nine is Bira Moretti. And number 10 is Peroni. And so there you go. So I find this quite ironic. So I do, because uh, let's be totally honest. If people weren't buying and drinking these beers, then these beers would be getting made and they wouldn't be in their pubs. That's what it really comes down to. It's quite simple. These conglomerates make these beers is because people buy them. They're there to make money. And it comes down to a very simple fact is if we make something, no matter how cheap and nasty it is, but if we make it and market it right, that makes it appealing to the punters. And if the punters are buying it, we'll keep on making it. So that's what it comes down to. So this idea of saying it's boring, well, the reason why it's there is because of you, drinkers like you. Um, it's not because of drinkers like me, because if I go to the pub, I don't buy that. I buy ale, traditionally. So yeah. And then what they did was they actually asked them that uh, what would you like to see, basically? I actually turned around and asked these idiots, and I'm going to call them idiots because that's what they are. To complain about something that they've created is unbelievable, you know, it's just nonsense. But they actually basically asked them what lager they wanted at the local. And this is how stupid they are. I mean, really, you can understand why I'm calling them idiots. And they basically turn around and they come out with nonsense like, the list of beers drinkers would most want to try, according to Kingfisher Drinks, was number one, Red Stripe. <sighs> Seriously. That piss water. I remember that in the 70s and 80s. And they're very popular in student unions and festivals, if I remember rightly. It's just rubbish. Estrella. Again, it's okay, nothing special. Sagre. Again, okay, nothing special. Budvar. You know, Budweiser, Budvar, again, okay. It's, I'd probably say out the lot of them, Budvar, Budvar would be the better one. And then on number five, they said Hofmeister. You know, it's a bit of a curveball. So, yeah, so it's just utter nonsense. So it is madness, absolutely madness. But anyway, such is life. So, there you go. Now you like that for irony. You know, the people that have helped to create these piss waters being in your local pub are now complaining that they're in the local pub. Seriously. Right, let's see if we can top this up now. I think I might over gas this a little bit. I think I have over gas this. But anyway, 
We're getting him. <laughs> it's always a scene. You know, you do something and you, you know, everyone works fine. You think, well, would I do that if I didn't need to do that? And you think, okay, well, next time I won't. And then, of course, the next time you don't. And then you get something like that. But anyway, it's nice to be doing a mild. Um, one of the things is you don't get many chances to do mild because mild is probably mild and you know, kind of bitters are classes, really old men drinks, basically, the classes. Um, beer that's uh, past its sell by date, which I think is crazy. It's kind of getting a bit better now, maybe just a wee top up. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, would you call it like that? Um, a lot of pubs and breweries seem to think that mild and bitters, especially if you look at your kind of craft. Beer breweries, they never look at these type of beers, which is quite sad because at one point these were the two most popular beers in the UK, bitters and mild, to the point is they were so popular they even used to blend them together in the pubs and that type of stuff. You could do to get blended them together. That's how popular they were. And they actually are still really nice beers. Now this one, of course, it's based on an 1890s recipe, but of course, obviously, it has to be adjusted because of modern day grains and the yield you get from them. But even then, it's still showing it because, like I said, it's a 4.1%. Um, and again, because of that, it's kind of at the higher end, so it's classed as a more of a strong mild. Milds are usually kind of three to three and a half normally. So this is a kind of, at the kind of stronger end of the scale. So, what does it smell of? I'm getting fruitiness. I'm getting some grain, a little bit of malt, but mostly kind of fruitiness. I'm getting kind of, how would you call it? Fruits of the forest, kind of berry like, you know, red berries, that type of thing. Actually, smells really quite nice. So, let's see what it tastes like. Nice. Really nice. Mm. It's a wee bit unusual because it's got that kind of more fruitiness to it. Um, it's got a nice level of malt, but the thing that stands out is that kind of fruity flavours in the mid-tongue, which is a bit unusual. I'm not saying it's completely unusual, but with a lot of the kind of males available nowadays, and there isn't really that many, let's be totally honest. Um, especially available kind of up and down the country. And uh, yeah, it's not a kind of normal kind of, uh, bit of flop there. it's not a kind of normal flavour profile that you would expect nowadays. But it's nice. It just gives that little bit of edge to it. And uh, It makes it more interesting as well because what I'm getting with it is that uh, it's not just leaving it to the malt to kind of carry it. You know, a lot of times there's the cases where like you taste a lot of these sessionable beers. One of the major things about my old is it is a session beer. And the thing about that is a lot of times <clears throat> the malt forward They're not so much in the hop side, and uh, they're really asking the malt and the grain to carry it. And again, that's lower alcohol. It's given them quite a lot of work to do. And again, it can be come out quite kind of what we call meh, kind of a bit kind of lacking in kind of flavour and interest. It's kind of more of a liquid rather than you know an experience. That type of thing, it just kind of lacks the kind of different dimensions to keep it interesting and, and, and keep 
keep the drinker kind of occupied and interested. And a lot of the, one of the big problems is you, you malt forward beers are great, that's fine, but the problem is though, you've got to make it interesting. Now you might have to mix up the malts a bit to try and get kind of some different flavour profiles. You might have to add a little bit more hops to maybe try and kind of mix it up a bit, maybe get a bit more bitterness at the end or something like that. You've got to try and do something because again, if it's just relying on kind of a standard kind of malt kind of blend, then it can get quite boring and tiresome very, very quickly. And uh, I think with this, with fruitiness, adds again, another dimension, another element, which just makes it kind of nice and make it kind of interesting. What I would say though is a really nice mouthfeel, but again, it is keg and it is a live beer, and that's one of the things um, I'm enjoying right now. And even though I'm doing an adnums, which I wasn't planning to do, well, I was planning to do, but not at this point, um, I'm not a great fan of the adnum brewery, I'll be totally honest, especially with a lot of the stuff in the, in the bottle. A lot of it's quite kind of mediocre, I'll be totally honest, and some of it's just dreadful. And uh, yeah, I've always kind of, you know, when I've been in the supermarkets and you're looking at the kind of shelves and you say, oh, there's Adams, all right, I've not done that one. But you start looking about for other ones and hopefully you'll find something kind of better that you haven't done. Because you always look like, oh, there's an Adams that I haven't done. Now let's see what else I've got. And it's like that, it's like, if I do get it, it's because right, there isn't that many available on the shelves that will have done that right, I can get two there. And a lot of times they would maybe take the Adams to kind of make it up, like say it was in Morrison's and they were doing kind of like three for two or something like that, which they used to do or, or as they're doing it, then I might get an Adams <clears throat> because of that, just to make it up. Trying to avoid them because I've not had that much luck. Um, broadside, the strong heel, was was okay in the bottle, it, it was okay. But other ones I've done, like the English flag or um, ghost ship and things like that, now, they're okay, but they're nothing special. I mean, there's a lot of other beers I would choose before, I would choose then, you know, that type of thing. And especially after doing the broadside, in the keg and it actually being a bitter rather than a strong ale and completely different beer. It kind of showed me that, well it didn't show me but it kind of confirmed to me that basically that the beer you're getting in the mini kegs is actually the real beer. It's the beer that's actually going into the casks. Now it's not being managed and conditioned the same way as casks, so it's going to be slightly different when you're getting it. But at least, again, obviously, when you're pouring it from these type of machines, you're getting closer because you're not really adding um, the air to it. So you're getting a more kind of usable product because it will last a bit longer than everything else. Obviously, if you're just pouring it from the tap on the actual keg itself, then you're drawing actual air into it which will start to spoil all the beer. Whereas if, with me, it's a case of these machines, you're printing CO2, so you're not really kind of basically uh, having air added to the the vessel and the beer's not being basically in contact with, with air, which again, would basically spoil it. So on that basis, I prefer the kegs right now because I'm getting a better quality product. I'm not getting the pasteurised product that you get in most bottles. And this is the thing is, the beer you're getting in the bottles have been pasteurised, most of them. There is some that are kind of, you know, bottle conditioned live beers, but they're not that many. There's really, they're few and far between now. Bottle conditioned beers. Um, so there's no yeast there or things like that. So these are kind of pasteurised beers, one to kill off, 
yeast and prevent any further fermentation, but also to kind of increase the shelf life of the beer so it lasts longer in the bottle and things like that. And it does affect the beer and it does change the beer. There you go. And I think this is the thing that kind of stands out with the kegs. It is a lot closer to what you're going to be getting in the pubs from the cask. So for me, if I'm paying the same type of price as we're buying in bottles, like this is working out £2 a glass. If we're buying the bottles at £2, then I'm actually winning because I'm getting a better product. That's what it comes down to. So I would recommend the kegs. If you can get kegs and you can facilitate them and, and be able to utilise them, then I would always recommend getting the keg version rather than the bottle version. But let's break down these flavours. Starts off nice bit of malt. So there is not really any that much sweetness at the front of the mouth, but it's got some nice kind of malt levels. Kind of roasted malt. So you're, you're getting a kind of slightly kind of molasses feel to them. Not a heavy molasses or a thick, rich molasses feel, but you are getting that slight kind of a roasted kind of molasses feel to them. And with the grain kind of backing it up and a little bit of sweetness, and I'm talking about a little bit, so it's quite light at the front end. Nice level of malt, which you get in miles, but it doesn't have that sweetness to go with it. You know, some of them you do get that, it's just like you get with porter sometimes, you do get this kind of a bit too sweet at the front end. The sweetness doesn't come in until the mid tongue, but while it's coming in in the mid tongue, you've still got the, the malt there that kind of slightly molasses kind of esque kind of maltishness and the grain but then you start picking up these kind of accents of kind of like fruits of the forest kind of summer fruits type thing kind of the berries now they're not kind of individual but you, you kind of pick them up they're more kind of slightly red berries maybe kind of raspberry strawberry that type of thing but it's, it's not kind of individual flavours, it's just a kind of a collective of a kind of like slightly red berry-ish kind of flavour. And it's actually quite nice because like I say, it gives it another dimension. But you've also got a little bit of sweetness there now, but you still have that slight bitterness coming from the the malt. So you have got this kind of slight bitter edge to the kind of malt flavours. And it just kind of balances everything out and it's actually really, really nice. And then you go over towards the kind of aftertaste. On the back of the mouth. And uh, the flavours start to kind of dissipate. And you just get this kind of light bitterness. Just at the back end. Ever so slight. But just enough. And just as the berries are starting to kind of dissipate. The kind of berry flavour. And that sweetness starts to kind of dissipate. You start getting this little bit of bitterness just coming over the top just to kind of finish off the back of the mouth and yeah just a uh, very easy drinking very pleasant beer actually and uh i'm enjoying it and uh i'm glad i've got plenty to enjoy and that's another benefit of buying the kegs but i'm going to be doing more kegs because i'm enjoying them and it's kind of kind of revitalized my enthusiasm because I'll be told totally sometimes you get so sick of it because, you know, you buy bottle after bottle and it just turns out to be, you know, mediocre crap and you're like, I'm getting sick of this, you know. And then you get, you know, a couple of good bottles and it kind of jeez you up again and then you're back down to the kind of, I'm not really kind of, I'm not really getting the beer that I'm looking for. And uh, I think some of the times it's maybe not so much to do with, because sometimes you get responses that you review the beer in the bottle and people say, oh, it's really nice in cask. Oh, I had that in cask. It was lovely. And that's the problem is what you're getting on cask isn't transferring to the bottle very well. And that's one of the problems. Whereas I'm getting better beer from the mini kegs. So um, a lot of the breweries round about kind of extra area um, they also do the mini kegs, but they do them to order, so you actually have to phone them up, same as you're basically ordering cask. You phone them up 
and then they'll fill them up for the next day for you to go and collect them. So I will be doing some of that. So I'll be doing some of the kind of beers that I've done before round about the kind of local area down in Darren. And uh, obviously we'll see what they like in the mini kegs and see how they compare. I'm not going to do a straight comparison. You'll have the bottle and have the kind of mini keg and kind of compare them because I don't think that's particularly fair because one's got the fresh live beer and one's a kind of pasteurised version and I just don't see the point in doing that because... I've done it a couple of times and there was no real comparison. You mean the mini keg version won easily. So th there's no real benefit from that. But what would I give this out of 10? There's a question. Well, I like miles. I've always liked miles. And it annoys me. Because with my experience with miles is they're becoming less and less available. Less and less breweries are doing miles. And I always find it strange because the breweries that actually do still make miles. A lot of times you go and try and buy them online. I've always found them out of stock. They're sold out. And you're sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute here. If nobody's really making miles because partly nobody obviously wants them, because let's be totally honest, if people want them, then of course you would make them. It'd be a daft kind of... Uh, business you know practice if you are if a customer wants something but you don't not making it then that's daft I mean, if you're in business then make the stuff that people want and then of course they'll buy it so a lot of breweries think well it's an old man's drink and no point in making it because nobody wants it but the breweries that still make it it's quite hard to get because it always seems to be bloody sold out now maybe they don't make it in great numbers but even then by not making great numbers they still manage to sell it so I always think it's a, it's a kind of a mis, misjudged beer. Same nowadays with bitters. A good bitter is, is a really, really good beer. A good mild is a really, really good beer. And I kind of miss, to be totally honest, I miss good bitters and I also miss good milds. So on that basis, um, just because I'm really enjoying it, it's got some nice flavour profiles, it's got a really nice mouthfeel, and just overall it's just a really, really nice beer. Which just tell me that Adams make far better live beers than they do bottle beers. It really is that simple. And on that basis, I'm going to give this an 8. An 8 out of 10. And it's an easy 8 out of 10. In fact, I could get close to an 8.5, to be totally honest. But yeah, it's an easy 8 out of 10. It's 4.1%. It's a 5 litre mini keg. It's about... 20 quid plus the delivery. I think the delivery is working out basically between the two kegs, it's working out roughly about just over £3.50. So it's roughly about £23.50 delivered per, per keg as long as you buy them in multiples of two. So for me, let's be totally honest, it's a no brainer to be totally honest. For me, yeah, it's worth it. If you compare it, not with the price of the bottles, but compare it to the price of buying it by the pint. How much would it cost you for a pint of this beer if you're buying it in a pub? And how much does it cost you to actually have it and enjoy it in your home? So yeah, 8 out of 10, 4.1%, 5 litre keg. Definitely would recommend it. Thanks for watching. Cheers. And bye for now.